Welcome back, everyone. I hope uh, the first day wasn't too harsh on you and uh, you still have some energy for uh, today. Um, what we're going to do today is that we're going to... So if there's still uh, one more module that I'm supposed to cover. Uh, but I think it's more important that you know we make sure we finish this one because it's probably the one that yeah, that is the most interesting to you anyway. Um, and then if we have some time left, we'll talk about the the last module. Um, <clears throat> before I start, is there any questions about what I covered yesterday? Some of the material we uh, went over. No questions? So are we going to have like some real examples, like have data set and try to not just look at some flaws, just try to like uh, come up with, uh, let's say, G-signature or something like that, but it's just very uh, And the other thing, like, um, is there any special requirement for the tables that you can work with the R? OK. No, there's no there's no requirements. Um, so the read that table is very flexible. You can you, there's a lot of options you can play with. So for example, you could have header, you could have no header. You can skip a few lines at the beginning if you want to when you read the table. Um, of course, there's a limitation of space, right? I mean, it all depends on a computer and how much memory you have on it. If you've got, you know. Doesn't matter. I mean, it's it's very very flexible. You could have names for the columns and rows. You could have no names. Uh, you could have uh, different things to separate. You could have quotes around. You, it's very very flexible. You just have to play with it um, and, and and to get a feel of how to get it to work on your data set. But typically, the default will work for most data sets if it's you know if it's n nice enough in the way it's formatted. And to answer the other question, so we're going to see some examples in gene expression, but I mean, we're not going to look at uh, gene signature and things like that because it's sort of beyond the scope of this workshop. But uh, <coughs> we're going to look at um, the HIV data set and try to find differentially expressed genes. And uh, hopefully, you're going to get a feel of how to uh, apply that to other data sets. I mean, it's going to be very similar. Any other questions? Okay, so yesterday we talked about, um, <clears throat> well, we finished by talking about the t-test, the one-sample t-test, the two-sample t-test, and the paired t-test. And basically, for microarrays, you would either do a two-sample t-test or a paired t-test, right, which is just like doing a one-sample t-test on the paired differences <clears throat> when you've got a cDNA microarray. And remember, I asked you a question about, you know, what is a p-value? Uh, is the p-value is the probability of uh, making an error? And in fact, it's not, because we said the p-value is only related to one kind of error, okay? And this is what we're going to talk about now. These are <coughs> actually very, very important when you do a statistical test, and these are called the type 1 and type 2 error rates. <coughs> okay, so let's look at a, a small table. This is the decision we're going to make respect the, to the test. We could either reject the null hypothesis, say uh, the gene is differentially expressed, that is, there is a change, or we could say, no, it's not differentially expressed, and therefore we accept the null hypothesis. But in fact, this is the decision we make, right? And we don't really know if we're, if we're right. And there's two outcomes. Either um, <clears throat> H1 is true, that is, we should really reject, or H0 is true, and therefore we should accept, right? So if you look at this small table, you're going to see a couple of things where, uh, where we're going to make a mistake. Basically, here we accept, but the null hypothesis was wrong. <coughs> and here we uh, reject, but the null hypothesis was correct. Okay? So these are the, the uh, two possibilities where we're going to make a mistake. And here are the two things where we're going to be correct. So the first one here, it's called the type 2 error. So we're going to accept the null hypothesis. We're not going to reject it, but it was, in fact, the gene was, in fact, differentially expressed, for example. There was a difference. We should have rejected the null, hypoth the, uh, null hypothesis. So this is kind of like a false negative. We're missing something, right? We say it's not differentially expressed, but, in fact, it was. <clears throat> the other kind of mistake we can make, it's probably the one we, we are more afraid about, is the type 1 error where we're going to reject something, but in fact, 
it was um, not differentially expressed. <coughs> so we're saying that gene is differentially expressed, but in fact it's not. Okay, so there's two kinds of mistakes you can make. Is this sort of clear, this table? Okay, so let's try to understand how uh, or when are we going to make these mistakes uh, based on the test statistics. So here, let's assume that the null hypothesis is mu naught is equal to zero. So we're looking at the log ratios and, and we're asking uh, to ourselves, is the mean of the log ratio equal to zero or not? If it is equal to zero, the gene is not differentially expressed. If it's not equal to zero, it is differentially expressed. So remember, <coughs> um, that what we're going to do typically with a statistical test is that we're going to fix the type 1 error rate. So we're going to fix the, uh, the, the significance level, which is, um, uh, let's say, 0 0.05. This is what people typically use uh, in practice. And then we're going to say, if our p-value is less than 0 0.05, then I'm going to reject. If it's greater than 0 0.05, I'm not going to, <coughs> to reject. So let's say this is the value here, the cutoff, so that the area under the curve in red over here is 0 0.05. If I get a test statistic that's above that value or below that value, I'm going to reject it, okay? But in fact, if the null hypothesis is true, if this is really the distribution here, okay, that is centered at zero, it's still possible that once in a while I'm going to get something fairly extreme in the tails above the, um, the significance level. That is, it's possible that we make a type 1 error rate, and the probability of making a type 1 error rate is 0 0.05, right? Because it's possible that by chance alone, I get something in the tail of my null distribution. Of course, it's very unlikely, and we're okay with making um, an error, and that's why we set it at 0 0.05. On the other hand, it's possible that, uh, in fact, the null hypothesis is not true, and <coughs> in this case, the mean, the true mean is 3, which you can see here with that distribution. Okay, and, and because the true mean is three, it's gonna be very likely that we're gonna get something above that value, right? So we're going to reject because most of the time the, t the test statistic is going to be above um, the, the critical value here. However, by chance alone, it's also possible that I get something that's below that, and therefore I'm not going to reject the null hypothesis even though it's true. The greater, mu naught is going to be, the further away it's going to be from zero, you know, the, the, the greater the chance that I'm going to reject uh, the null hypothesis. Therefore, I'm not going to make an error. So here, this is the type 1 error rate, and in green, this is the type 2 error rate. Is this sort of clear what we see in this picture? This is sort of important, so if, if you don't really understand, please let me know and I can try to explain it again. Okay, so we're going to use the board a little bit. So remember, <coughs> here we've got, so the null hypothesis is mu naught is equal to zero. So we want to know if, is the mean equal to zero or not? If it is equal to zero, then this is going to be distribution for my statistic. Okay, remember that it should be a t statistic within minus one degrees of freedom. Then th this is going to be my, dis my the distribution for my test statistic. And then typically you're going to compute the p-value, and you're going to say if the p-value is less than a 0.05, I'm going to reject the null hypothesis. But rejecting uh, if the p-value is less than 0.05 is the same thing as computing of having the value. Here, would, so we're gonna typically we're gonna call this one um, something like z of alpha over two and minus d of alpha over two. And I'm gonna ex to explain to you what that means. So this is the value so that you get alpha over two over here under the curve and alpha over two over here under the curve. Okay, and if you take alpha, your significance level is 0.05. This means that here you've got 5% that's covered in the tails of that distribution. Okay? 
then <clears throat> if the t-statistic that we observe is greater than this value or less than this value, so let's say this is the value we observe over here, this is our t-statistic, then we're going to say, well, if the mean was really zero, okay, if the null hypothesis is true, and I get something that extreme, you know, in the tail, even though I know it's pretty unlikely that I get something that extreme, because the probability is 0.05, I'm going to reject. So if I get something above that value, below that value, I reject the null hypothesis, because it's very unlikely that I get something like that by chance alone. And in fact, the probability that I do is 0.05. Okay? <clears throat> And remember, if, if I get the, this value here, I can also compute the p-value, which will be the area over here, and minus t over here. Okay, so you can see the, the relationship between the p-value um, <clears throat> that we compute, which is this in green, and the significance level. If the p-value is less than a 0.05, okay, which it is here, because you've got less area under the curve, then you reject, so it's the same thing. So you could reject either if P is less than 0.05, which is the same thing as saying if your T statistics is above zero of alpha over two, or minus T is less than zero of alpha over two, okay? So the, these are two ways to look at it, to say I reject if the p-value is less than 0.05, or if, if my uh, test statistics is above the critical value so that Above that, I get alpha over 2 and alpha over 2 over here. Does that make sense? If it does not make sense, please let me know. Yes? So what's the, what, what's the uh, level above the 2? Uh, this is alpha over here. Yeah, and the lower one? Alpha. Oh. Z. Yeah. Z. This is, so this is the value. So okay, give, let, let me give me an, an example. So if, if alpha is 0.05, if I want 5%, then typically this, the value will be about uh, almost 1.96 or so, you know, about 1.96 and minus 1.96. And you can get that from R. So if alpha is 0.05, then this is about 1.96. Okay, so you can actually get that from a table and then if your test statistic is above that value or is below the negative of that value, reject. Okay? <clears throat> on the other hand, here what I show you on that figure is that it's possible that the, the null hypothesis is wrong. So in fact, the true mean is not zero, but mu is equal to, let's say, three. Okay? In which case, the true distribution is not that one, but it's something like that. Well, here you've got three. <clears throat> so of course, if this is the true distribution, then it's going to be very likely that I get something above the critical value and therefore I'm going to reject. But it's also possible that I get something below the critical value, right? Because by chance alone, I can get something, um, sorry, I can get something below the critical value over here and therefore, it's possible that I'm going to make a mistake. That is, I'm not going to reject when I should reject the null hypothesis. Okay, and the further away the true mean is, then the less likely that I'm going to make a mistake, a type 2 error. So this is the probability of making <clears throat> a type 1 error over here in red, and in green is the probability of making a type 2 error. Okay? So <coughs> I'm not really going to go through the, um, the sample size calculation because it's, it's a bit tricky. Uh, but this sort of tells you that using these kinds of, of plots, you can sort of guess how many sample points do I need in, in, in my sample to be able to uh, decrease the probability of making an error uh, of type 2. So I'm not going to go through that, but I'm going to give you a good reference uh, for this. So you can actually go and do a calculation. Uh, you need to do a little bit of algebra for the calculation. But there's actually, uh, so I've got a good colleague at the University of British Columbia who has a few sample size calculators. 
But what I want to say is that if we go back to the plot, so for the sample size calculation, you can just input a, f a few things like uh, uh, your standard error, uh, the difference between the true mean and, and the null hypothesis, and then it will, give, it will tell you the, um, how many, um, um, how many uh, um, so what, what sample size do you require to have the power that you want or to have a given uh, type 2 error rate? So if we go back to this plot, what we see over here is that if I move this distribution on the right, then the, uh, the green shaded area is going to be, become smaller and smaller and smaller, right? So if mu, if the true mean is very far from the null hypothesis, so if it's 100, then of course this is going to be almost zero, right? I mean, it's going to be so easy. It's going to be so far from the true mean that if you take a sample, you're going to see right away that it's not zero. If it's very close to the true mean, Right? If you take a, a small sample, you're not really going to be able to know if, it's, if the mean is really zero or not. But the more, the more data you're going to get, you know, the better and better your estimate of the mean is going to be, and therefore the more you're going to be able to tell if it's zero or not. Okay? So that's the idea behind the sample size calculation, is that if you increase the number of, of, um, <coughs> sample of uh, data points, then you're going to be able to discriminate better and better between the null hypothesis and the true mean. That makes sense? So if, if you ever come up to a problem where um, <clears throat> you need to do a sample size calculation, then you can do it. You can go on this website. You just enter a few numbers, very, very simple calculation. Uh, and it's just going to take a few seconds. It's going to give you the, the sample size. The drawback of a sample size calculation, so sometimes people say, um, you know, they come to me and they say, oh, how many, uh, you know, what sample size should I use to, for, for, uh, for my study? And I say, well, I don't know anything about your study, so how can I tell you how many, you know, data points do you need? Because the problem with the sample size calculation is that you, you need to have a rough idea of a couple of things. First, the standard error, but also the difference between the true mean and the null hypothesis. Because if you don't know that, then you cannot really compute uh, the sample size that you need. But in reality, in practice, you never know that, right? You never know what the true mean is, because if you did, then you wouldn't do the experiment to begin with. Um, so it's a bit tricky. So sometimes when you want to do a sample size calculation, what you can do is that take a small sample, you know, maybe get an estimate of the standard error and an estimate of the difference between the true mean and the null hypothesis, and then maybe you can work, so, you know, some kind of a number. But it's pretty tricky to do sample size calculation that usually I just say, well, I don't know how to do it because I don't know anything about your experiment. And of course, typically people don't really want to take a few data points because if they ask you that question is that they really want to know the answer to that. They don't have to do these two steps. Any questions about this? Pretty much, yeah. So what you can do, once you have your, you, you've done an experiment, you get your data, what you can do is that you can compute the sample mean from your data set, okay? And this will give you an estimate of the true mean, right? So let's say I compute the sample mean, and in this case, it's 2.8. Of course, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that that mu naught is not zero, because there's some variability. It could be that, you know, I was very unlucky, and I got a bad estimate of, of the mean. But the more data point you're going to take, the, you know, the more unlikely it's going to become that by chance alone you get that number, right? So that's the idea of the sample size calculation. What you can do is that take a few numbers, maybe c compute the, the sample mean, and then plug that in into the sample size calculator, and that's going to tell you how many data points you, you, you need in order to uh, minimize the type 2 error. So it, with that value, let's say it's 2.8. The t-test, the mu equal to zero is in this case not equal to zero, but equal to two. No, it's still. I mean, this the the null hypothesis. You know it. This is something you want to test. It has nothing to do with your data set, and you should never change after you observe the data set because you know that you want to test it, right? 
So in, in this case, typically you know what you're testing, right? So here we really want to know if the log, um, like the, the log ratio is zero or not, right? So you know that beforehand. Then once you observe your data, you're going to be able to test that null hypothesis. But you kind of just upload the data, compute the mean, and say, oh, okay, I'm going to test that. You always have to fix everything beforehand before you see the data, and then you see the data, and you decide whether or not you want to reject you know, the uh, null hypothesis. Okay? Okay. Let's move on to something that's very interesting. <coughs> um, so what we've seen so far in the examples is that we've done a single hypothesis testing, right? We say, is gene 1 different she express? Is gene 4 different she express? But this is not really what you do in practice, right? You want to know what are the genes that are different she expressed in my data set. Okay, so we're not going to do a single hypothesis testing. We're going to do lots of tests at once. So when you do a single hypothesis testing, the rule is to say, okay, let's fix the type 1 error rate, which is the alpha I have described. Typically, people would choose 0.05. And then we're going to try to minimize the type 2 error rate. So we fix the alpha, the probability of making, um, of having a false positive, And then we're going to try to, <coughs> excuse me, minimize the probability of having a false negative. Typically, you don't, have, you don't really have to think about minimize the type 2 error rate because the, the, the t-statistics, for example, is designed or traditional uh, tests are designed to minimize the type 2 error rate. So once you fix the alpha, you will just compute the p-value and do you know, as you've done before without even thinking about the type 2 error rate. In fact, in practice, people are, are very often very concerned with the type 1 error rate, with the false positives. Of course, you don't want too many false negatives either. But false positive are generally more costly than false negatives. Because you know you need to validate, you're going to spend a lot of time, and then at the end you, you realize it's just wrong, and so you wasted all that money on validation and so forth. So the problem is uh, that we want to perform many tests at once. Okay? It's, just, it's not just a single test, but in many tests at once. So will the type 1 error rate be alpha is 0.05? So let's say I do 10,000 tests, and for each of them I fix alpha to 0.05, I do my t-test. Do you think at the end the probability of making uh, an error, a type 1 error rate is really 0.05? That is, the probability of having a false positive is 0.05. It's not, because if you want, you're going to have so many things where it's possible to have a false positive that at the end, you're certainly going to have more than you know, uh, 0.05 for the probability. So we're going to see a small example to illustrate that. <coughs> so uh, in our case, the, the error probability is going to be much greater because we're looking at many genes, for example, right? So multiple testing is used to control an overall measure uh, of the error. So in, instead of trying to control the type 1 error rate for each test, we're going to say, let's try to, to control a global, a global measure of the error. And there are two things you can do. The first one is called the family-wise error rate. And the second one is called the false discovery rate. So here's a small illustration of that. So here we've got a thousand t I, I do a thousand t test. So I've generated some data from a normal distribution. Um, yeah, so th these are from a normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one. And I generated basically uh, a thousand uh, genes with five replicates. And <coughs> for each of these, I'm going to do a t test. And then I'm going to look at how many t-tests are uh, significantly, how many genes are sig significantly differentially expressed. Basically, all of the null hypotheses are wrong, so I should uh, never reject the null hypothesis. Okay, because they are generated from uh, distribution with mean zero. So all of the genes are not differentially expressed, I should not reject anything. But we know that it's possible that you're going to make an error. Right? And in fact, for a, single, for a single test, we know that it's 0.05 because we use the significance level of 0.05. So the probability of making an error of type 1 or having a false positive is 0.05. Okay, let's look at that in R. So I need to open the script. <coughs> 
Okay, so this is here. So once again here, I set the seed so that we all get the same data. Then here what I do is that I, I generate uh, 100,000 data, um, 100,000 um, data points from a Gaussian distribution with mean zero and star deviation one, and then I form a, a matrix of uh, size 1,000, and so 1,000 rows and, and five columns. And then for each of these guys, I'm going to do a t-test. The way I do it to be slightly more e efficient, I'm going to use the apply function. And the way I'm going to do that, I'm going to create my own function. And this function is that you give me the data. And I'm going to test if the alternative is uh, true or false. <coughs> okay, so I do one sample t-test to cite it. And then I just return the p-value. So here I'm going to get um, a bunch of p-values. So if you type p, you will see all the p-values for each of the test. Then here I'm going to count how many p-value, how many tests, uh, how many null hypotheses uh, am I going to reject. So I'm just going to count how many p-values are less than 0.05, right? Because typically we reject if the p-value is less than 0.05. So I'm going to count these guys. And I'm going to see that I have 44, right? And I have a thousand tests. <coughs> so here, the error rate is about 44 divided divided by a thousand. So what we can see is that, I, so I fixed the 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 error rate to a 0.05. Uh, the type one error rate, but I get quite a few false positive. In fact, I get 44. Um, <clears throat> so it's certainly a lot more than I thought I would get because you know I fixed the error of making a mistake to uh, a type one error to 0.05. So the idea is to say, okay, what if we try to fix something else, like a global error rate? And the first one that, that people have started to use was called the family-wise error rate, is to say, let's not try to do each single test and fix the error of making a type one, uh, the probability of making a type one error. It's to say, let's try to fix the probability of making at least one type one error for all the tests. So I'm gonna try to, to uh, fix the number of errors I'm going to get over all the tests. The most, um, so one way to do that is via multiple testing. So you're going to try to modify your p-values so that this is going to be satisfied. Okay? Because if we just, if we just work with the, um, <clears throat> the classical p-values that we got for each of the single individual t-test, this doesn't work very well. So what we're going to do is that we're going to say, okay, we want to be slightly more conservative, so we're going to work with these p-values and making them slightly larger in order to control the overall error rate. And the first one that uh, people have used is called Bonferroni multiple adjustment. So what you do here is, let's say you've got capital G genes, in this case it's maybe 1,000, 10,000, what you're going to do is very simple. You take all of your p-values, you multiply by the number of tests, the number of genes. Okay? That's very simple. And if you do that, <coughs> then you will, um, you will call differentiate express all the genes that have the p-value less than alpha. Then you know that the overall, the family-wise error rate, so the probability of making at least one uh, type 1 error will be less than alpha. So you're going to control the overall error rate. What's the problem with this? Can you try to guess if there's a problem? Yeah, I mean, imagine, you know, imagine you're doing um, 100,000 tests, right? You're doing like a genome-wide something uh, with a tiling array. You've got millions of probes across the whole genome and you're doing all of these tests. Well, you take a, a single p-value, you multiply that by a million. 
well, it's going to be very unlikely that uh, your p-value is going to be very small at the end, right? So if g is too large, you might be slightly too conservative because it, it, you, the number of tests you have is so large that when you're going to multiply your p-value by that number, it's going to become large and, and never is going to be, nothing's going to be significant. So this is one of the drawbacks of Bonferroni. It's very simple uh, and it guarantees that you're going to control the, the family-wise error rate, but it's slightly too conservative. In fact, there are other procedures that are very similar to this that are slightly more uh, powerful, that is not as conservative, but they don't change that much. It's just that the idea of controlling the family was error rate is not very good because maybe you don't care if you make one mistake when you, when you have a million tests. Maybe you're okay with making a few mistakes when you've got a million tests, right? So maybe these, this is not the right, uh, the right quantity to control because here you're saying, I want the probability of making at least one mistake extremely small. Therefore, it's going to be very unlikely that you find anything because if you do and there is one possible false positive in your list, you're going to say, no, 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 I don't want that. Okay? And that's why often with these types of correction, you're not going to find uh, many things. Is that sort of clear? Yeah? So then... Um, <clears throat> I think it was in the 90s, uh, came along the false discovery rate. And the false discovery rate was actually invented by a couple of statisticians. And it really came out because most of the problems, you know, real life problems, uh, started to become sort of uh, high throughput. You had many tests at once that you needed to do. And the, the, the only thing that we had before was the family was error rate, which was not very well adapted to these new technology that were high throughput. So the idea of the false discovery is to say, I don't care if I have a few false positives, I'm okay with a few false positives, as long as the proportion of false positives that I have in what I declare significant is small enough. So you say, you know, I'm okay if I've got 10 false positives, as long as in my list I've got a thousand things that are true, I can deal with five false positives. So that's the idea, is to say, let's try to control not the probability of making a single mistake, but try to control the proportion of false positive among the genes that are called differentially expressed. Okay? <clears throat> so this was uh, derived by Benjamin and Hochberg in 95, and then there's been a lot of modification of, of this FDR procedure, uh, but um, it hasn't changed very much since, since, the, uh, the, 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 since 95. <coughs> so the procedure is slightly more tricky to understand how you would do the correction. I'm going to give you the formula and then I'll show you a plot because it's, it's much easier to understand on the plot. In fact, once you see the plot, it's very easy to do. Once again, the truth is that you'll probably never do that because R does it for you. There's a function that can do the multiple testing. You say I want FDR and you input your p-value. It outputs the corrected p-value and then life goes on. You can uh, declare your genes differentially expressed. Um, <clears throat> so here what you need to do for this procedure is that you would order all of your p-values, so you've got your g-test, you order all of the p-values from the smallest to the largest, and then you're going to pick the largest value, uh, k, so that p of g is less or equal than g divided by uh, capital G, the total number of genes, times alpha, the, uh, the proportion of false positive you're okay with. And then if you do that, if you call all of the, the, the genes differentially expressed that are less than this value, then you will know that the false discovery rate is controlled at a rate of alpha. Typically, for the false discovery rate, people are okay with 5% of false positive or 10% of false positive. So this probably doesn't tell you very much. It's not very intuitive why this will give you the right thing. In fact, um, even the proof is not very intuitive, but it's not very difficult to show that it's true. Let's look at it on the plot. You will understand what this means. Um, one key point here when you do uh, the FDR correction in that way is that the test need to be independent. Okay, so this is this might be kind of a problem. Um, do you think the the uh, when you're looking at gene expression data set, do you think all the genes are independent? No, because you know there's probably a lot of pathways and things that make one gene differentially express, and therefore the other one should also be differentially express. Um, so that the 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 Hypotheses are not actually exactly independent. However, it's been shown that even though here you require independent of the test statistic in order for this procedure to be valid, if it's not 
the price to pay is not too high, and in fact, it works out quite well. Well, <clears throat> if you knew that, if so, that I mean, that's a good point. If you could cluster the genes into the pathways or something where you know if this one's differentially expressed, so should be this one, and so forth, then it would be a lot easier because you you could sort of cluster the genes and then do a test for each of the different pathways or each uh, of the different clusters. And in fact, you will gain in power because you will have more t more uh, data for each of the clusters. Uh, but typically you don't know that beforehand, so you cannot really do that. But people have tried actually to work on, on things like that, where they say, okay, let's try to cluster genes, and at the same time we're going to see if each of the clusters is differentially expressed. Why are people okay with 10% costs? That, um, I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't really know. I mean, that's a good question. But I think it's because they want to make sure they've got... You know, the, the reality is that they say they're okay with 25%, and then you give them a list of, let's say, a thousand genes, but at the end, they're only going to look at the top 10. So, uh, I, so I, I, you know, this, this is not really... Uh, you shouldn't ask the question to me, because I, I don't really know. I think it's risk and cost, though. You have to think about that, right? Yeah. 5% chance of rain or 5% chance of yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. So it's all about the cost at the end, right? <clears throat> okay, so this is, I'm, I'm going to show you the, uh, the procedure here. <coughs> so this is, um, again, this is a toy example. I've, I've generated some data. I do a t test for each of these, and then I've got all of the p values. So I think I've generated the, the data in a way that they are 10% uh, of true positive here. So there's 10,000 genes, and you can see there's two things where I generate first 9,000 with a mean of 0, and then 1,000 with a mean of 5. So there's 10% of uh, true positive. So you would expect to see quite a few significant genes uh, in here. So the way the procedure works, um, visually, it's quite easy to understand. You order your p-values. So this is from, uh, only, I only show you the top 1,000 here because there are more genes above, but then the, the plot is, is too big. So you order the p-values from the, sol the, the smallest to the largest over here. Okay, so these are the p-values that are ordered. And then, remember the procedure. It says that if the p-value is less or equal than uh, uh, the index divided by the number of, of tests times alpha, you're going to reject. Basically, this is just, <clears throat> if you look at G times, G divided by capital, capital G times alpha, this is just the equation for a line. So you can actually draw that line. This is the line Y equal G divided by capital G times alpha. And then everything that's below the line will be called differentially expressed. Everything that's above will be called non-differentially expressed. Okay, so it's pretty easy to understand on that graphic how you do that. You order your p-values, and then uh, visually you can just say these are the differentially expressed genes. Of course, you don't really need to do that because here, if you look at it, there's a function called p.adjust that will do it for you. And here you can specify the method. You can look at Bonferroni, and you can look at FDR. Any questions? Okay, so. <clears throat> So it's difficult to explain all of these things on a PowerPoint presentation. But <clears throat> this is, you do a graphic like that, you've got the p-value and you've got the index, g for the gene. So you're going to have your first p-value. So these are ordered. The, you order the p-values, the first one. Okay, this is what I have over here. And then, so G is the index of the gene. <clears throat> then the formula says you're going to reject if the p-value for the gene G is less or equal than G divided by capital G times alpha. You're going to reject alpha. Okay? But this is, if you look at this, this is just, if you, if you look at this as a function of the index G, this is just 
alpha over g times small g. So this is just a line with slope alpha over g and intercept 0. So this is just a line that goes from 0 and that has a slope of alpha over capital G. Okay, so this is just y equal alpha capital G x. It's just the, the total number of tests, the total number of genes. Okay? And therefore, all of the genes that are below that line will satisfy that equation, and therefore you will uh, reject the null hypothesis for these guys. Okay? So this is actually very easy to understand graphically, but it's something that people never explain that way. I mean, if you look at a book, you will find this formula, but they will never show you a plot that says this is just a line and everything that's below, you do it that way. The R command that you listed there, you yes. need to specify, you don't have to specify the other uh, variables there, like the G value or... No, because what you, so you input the, all of your P values. So he knows the G, right, because he knows the length. Uh, he knows everything that he needs to do, right? So, and you will not, so when you, the output of it will not be, here's the list of different Shakespeare's genes. You will just output the corrected P values. Then it's your call to call them differentially express if the adjusted p-value is less than 0.05, for example, will tell you. And if you do that, then you know that the, the FDR will be 5%. Which is nice because you, it will adjust the p-value for you and then you still make the final call and you can try 5% and percent so forth. Say that again. Uh, the false discovery rate will be given by the value that, that you pick. So, of course, this is just an estimation, right? You, you never know the true value of the false discovery rate. Uh, you hope that if all, the so if all the assumptions are correct, if the test you're using if is correct, if the tests are independent and everything, then the theory tells you that the false discovery rate should be controlled at 5%. So it should be smaller than 5%, the true. But of course, in reality, not all the assumptions are going to be valid and satisfied. So you might get something that's slightly bigger than what you hope for, but at least it will help you in trying to decide on a cutoff, even though it's not, it might not be the exact false discovery rate you're hoping for. Okay? Okay, so... Good. Very good question. So. The Q value was, uh, was something that was actually in introduced by a friend of mine, uh, John Story. Uh, so John Story was uh, a student at Stanford and now he's actually uh, a full professor at, uh, um, what is it, the Institute for Genomics at Princeton or something? And the Q value was kind of like, a, a, so the, what, what I compute here and the adjusted P value will be the Q value in that case. So this is a Q-value. So the Q-value is kind of, kind of like the analog of the P-value, but it's using the false discovery rate. So if you, if you use 5% for your P-value, you will know that the false discovery rate is 5%. Um, but people don't use Q-value that much. I don't think, well, some, some people use the Q-value, but nowadays I think we're moving away from the Q-value because it's been a bit confusing for some people. Uh, so John might still be using the Q value a lot because he introduced it, but I've never liked it that much because I think it's pretty confusing for some people. But you, the, you're right. Here the adjusted P value will just be the, the Q value. Other questions? Okay. Um, so we've got all the code, so I, I prefer to show you some things, and you can play with the, uh, the code afterwards. And I should say that um, even though, you know, so I'm going to be leaving after this, this, this module pretty much. Um, of course, you can ask me some questions, but, you know, if in a couple of days, a uh, couple of weeks, a couple of years, you know, you look at the slides and you'll be like, oh, I don't understand what we're doing, feel free to drop me an email, you know, I'll be, uh, I'll be happy to try to explain uh, some of the things that, that are in the code. <clears throat> okay, so here what I do is that there's the HIV data set. We're going to do <coughs> a one sample t-test for uh, so all of the genes. 
And then I'm going to call the, the gene differentiate express if the p-value, just the row p-value, no correction is less than 0 0.05. So this is what I show you here. This is the MA plot. I'm, and I'm just highlighting the genes that I call differentiate express by the t-test. So of course, this is kind of doing the right thing, because you would expect the genes that are far away from the line y equals 0 to be differentiate express, either up or down, regulated. And you do have these uh, positive controls over here. But you get tons of stuff, right? And there's tons of stuff even towards the middle where probably this, this shouldn't be differentiate express. So you can see that if you just use the p-values of 0.05 doing no correction, you get a lot of false positive, which is what you expect because you have no idea on how to control the overall error rate. <clears throat> now if I do a bond for any correction, this is what I get. I get two little guys up there. And I, I completely miss even the ones that are so obvious that, I, that these are different express that are the HIV positive controls. So bond for any here is way too conservative. All right? You see it right away. <clears throat> If I do the FDR, well, it's better. Uh, I get most of the, the, the HIV differentiate expressed. Uh, but I do get one guy over here and one guy over here and one over here. So it's, that's a bit strange that I do get a couple of things that seem to have very low log ratio. So let's try to understand why you know, we get this, this uh, kind of behavior here. So what I'm going to show is the mean of the log ratio and the star deviation of the log ratio. <clears throat> so this is, um, this is just like the, the average of the log ratio across the four replicates against the standard deviation of the log ratio across the four replicates. What we can see is that many of these guys that were found different to express have high log ratio, but some of them have low log ratio low log ratio, but also log sta low uh, standard deviation. So how come they have very low log ratio, but they come out differentially expressed? Small. Yeah, and so? So the, even though the difference is small, if the, the variance between them is very small, you can still get them separated. Anyway. Right, so this so is... The, the, the the ratio between the difference and the noise, right? The exactly. So when you're going to compute the ratio, you, you, you remember when you compute the t-statistic, uh, t it's the ratio of the mean divided by the standard deviation, right? Something like that. So if the standard deviation, so if there's two ways the t-statistics can, can be big. <clears throat> it can either be, so here I, I use a different notation um, it's for the log ratio, but it's like the y. So there's two ways it can be big. Either the mean is large or this guy is small, right? If the standard deviation is very, very small, if you divide by something very close to zero, you're going to get a very large number, you know, no matter how big or small this is. So in theory, this is what, <clears throat> uh, this is how it should work, but in practice, it's not really how it's going to work, and I'm going to tell you why. So there's, there's a couple of problems for the t-statistics, is that for many genes, S is small. Why? Well, probably in practice it's not very small, but since we only have four replicates, some of the estimates we're going to get are going to be very noisy. And therefore, maybe by chance alone, you're going to get an estimate of the standard deviation that is very small. If you were to have a larger sample size, probably you would be fine. But this is one of the big problems when you're doing uh, high throughput uh, expression arrays and you, you're doing uh, gene expression testing that the sample size is small. And because the sample size is small, the estimate of the standard deviation is going to be very noisy. When you've got lots of genes, it's very likely that by chance alone, many of these will have a very small standard deviation and therefore a very large T statistics, even though probably they're not differentially expressed. Then there's also the question is, is T really T distributed? So we, you know, we said, well, if it's normal, it's fine. If it's not normal and the sample size is large, it's OK. Uh, and if it's not, then you're in trouble. You need to do something else. You, knew, you need to do a permutation test or maybe a non-parametric test or whatever. And here we just did the typical T test. Sorry. Yes? When you put the permutation test, 
Yes. And so you, you also apply the, the cross discovery rate? Exactly. All of the procedures we've talked about for multiple testing, they don't care about the test you use. They just care about a p-value. So if you've got a list of p-value, you can use them. If you use the t-test, Wilcoxon test, uh, permutation test, whatever, you get p-values, you can do it. <clears throat> okay, so for many genes, S is small, and that's kind of a problem because it gives us um, a large uh, T statistic, and that's bad news. So what can you do? So a simple, very simple things you can do is that you're going to add a small positive constant to the standard deviation. Therefore, if this gets too close to zero, you're going to get protected because you have that small constant that you're adding to uh, the standard deviation. So it's kind of a hack, right? It's not really, this is not really a test statistic. This is not really a t-statistic, but you define your statistics as how you, how you want, and then the problem is going to be how you're going to compute the p-value, and we're going to see that. <coughs> so in that case, when you, um, not only before doing that modification, but even after you do that modification is that, you might ask yourself, is t really t distributed? Well, in that case, it probably isn't because you modified it anyway. So what we can do is that we say, okay, we're going to do something slightly non-parametric. We're going to try to estimate the null distribution just by permitting the labels, as we've explained yesterday, and then we can compute a p-value from that. <coughs> okay, so under the assumption of no differential expression, we can just permute the columns of the data matrix. And then by counting how many times I observe something as extreme or more extreme, I'm going to compute <coughs> a p-value. So this is what SAM does. So SAM is for a significant analysis of microarrays. So I've got a, a good story, actually. So this is actually a paper that got published many, many times, uh, cited many, many, many times, because uh, first of all, it's, it's a good paper. It's really easy to understand. The methodology works well, uh, but also because there's an Excel plugin, yes. Oh, okay. Good, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so it, it, it's been used a lot because there's an Excel plugin. So for those who still want to use Excel, though, you know, I, I hope you're not going to use Excel after this workshop, you can. But there's also an R package that you can use that, that does the same thing. Uh, at the same time, we actually, so in my group, we. Uh, no, no, no. It's, it's independent. And so that paper gets cited uh, a lot of times. And at the same time, we actually published a paper which we'll call, uh, so this one was called Significant Analysis of Microarrays, and our paper was called Statistical Analysis of Microarrays. And we actually got a lot of citations because people you know, were thinking they were citing this one, but they actually cited our paper instead. So, <laughs> so if there's something that has a good name, and so just change the title a little bit with the same acronym, and maybe you're going to get a free uh, a few citations. So. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the idea is we're going to modify the test statistic. So it's almost like a T statistic. You get the log ratio, the average of the log ratio, you divide by the standard deviation, and then we add a small constant. So remember, the original T statistics, we also have the overall, uh, the square root of n. But here, because we're doing permutation, we don't even need to, we don't even need to put that in. It doesn't really matter uh, because we are estimating the p-value in a non-parametric way. So it doesn't change anything. So it just simplifies the formula not to put the uh, over the square root of n. So how do you estimate these guys? So the way they've done it is that <clears throat> they estimate the standard deviation of all the genes. And then they will take the uh, 95 percentile of that standard deviation. So it's like taking an estimate of uh, the standard deviation using all the other genes. And this is what I talked about yesterday is that, remember, when you do um, multiple testing or when you do testing on lots of genes at once, sure, you do each test separately, <coughs> but you've got some information coming from the other genes, right? So in that case, we're going to say, what's a pretty common standard deviation coming from all the other genes? And then we're going to use that and add it to uh, the standard deviation for that gene. So it's kind of like we're going to regularize the standard deviation using the standard deviations from the other genes. And Sam will do that for you. We'll estimate that number and you will add it to the standard deviation. And then you will estimate the distribution of T under the null by permitting the labels of uh, 
control and treatment, just like we've done uh, with the permutation test. For each permutation, you compute the new test statistic, and then um, this is also, <clears throat> this is what's nice about SAM, is that there are two ways you can control the false discovery. You can say, okay, let's try to compute the p-values and then adjust the p-values. SAM does it in a slightly different way. It's going to say, let's try to fix the rejection region. So we're going to reject if the test statistics is bigger than some value delta. And then for that value, we're going to try to estimate how many false positives do we have. And then we're going to pick the value that gives us the, false, the number of false positives that we're comfortable with. But it's very similar to computing your p-value and doing the adjustment afterwards. And then you can, uh, based on the number of false positives that you estimate after the permutation, you can actually fix the FDR that way. So there's, you know, there's the Excel plugin that you can use. There's the R package that you can use as well. Uh, it's pretty easy to use. So here, I, I uh, there's um, a big piece of code because I do lots of things to illustrate a few things. But in fact, you don't need to do all of that. So here's, if you use SAM in this data set, this is what you would get, right? You get something that's a lot cleaner. Uh, you can really see the up and down regulated genes. You get <coughs> also all of the, the, the true positive HIV genes. So this, this is really the sort of things that you, you, should, uh, you should see on a gene expression data set. This is what you expect. Of course, here, here there might be some false positive because I think I fixed it to, to 10%. So it's possible that you're going to get something uh, that, that you're going to get a few false positives. Maybe over here you can see that these could be false positives. But overall, I would say it looks very good. And it, it looks like it's doing something very sen uh, sensible here. Does that make sense? So this is just uh, basically an idea of saying, let's try to regularize the, the t-statistic, compute the FDR, and this is what you get. Okay, there are other methods that are pretty similar to SAM in spirit, so we've done lots of work on this. There's also another one that I like very, uh, very much, uh, which is called Lima. It's available in Bioconductor. It's very popular. People use it a lot. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> so the the the, the, the values are the same because the, the data set is the same and here I just display the MA plot. So what's important is are the, the green circles, right? And how many of these guys are highlighted. And if you go back, uh, let me go back. Okay, so you can see here that it's fairly different, right? I mean, you get lots of stuff in the middle where probably you shouldn't get anything, right? So you can see that the number of, of green circles that you have with SAM is way less than this. And it seems that it's doing the right thing because it's picking up the points that are sort of far away from the middle cloud. Do you see the difference between this one and the other? Yeah, so th this, is, this is fine, this is doing the right thing, yeah. but here you, you, you get a lot of false positive. You can see that these guys have almost uh, like a zero log ratio, but they are picking up, uh, uh, they're picked up as uh, differentially expressed by uh, the row p-values. Does that make sense? Yeah, so what some will do is that if the number of permutation, if the, the number of distinct permutation is low, so if you've got only, you know, two replicates, for example, there's only like three permutations you can do, so it's almost impossible. If you've got three, there's only, you know, that many you can do. Four, there's more. So you will do all of them if it's less than a thousand maybe or something. And otherwise, you will just pick a thousand random permutations, which is typically plenty for estimating the p-values. Okay, so remember yesterday when we talked about the permutation, I think you've asked uh, how many permutations do you, do you need or do you do? 
And I say, well, <clears throat> it depends on how many replicates you have, because if you've got only a few, there's only that many permutations you can do. Okay? In that case, Sam will do them all. If it's a small number, it will do all the possible uh, combinations. Mm -hmm. If that number is too large, it will randomly pick a subset of that. It's close to a thousand. But what's small and what's too large? I w a thousand is fine. And it's not too large, it's not too small. It's a trade-off, right? Because you could do... No, no, you no, no. What I'm asking is, then, what's the... Enum? So if some does 1,000 1, samples? No, 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 no. This, so, uh, if you, so if you get only four replicates, yes. then the number of permutations you can do for muting the labels is small because there's only a, a small number of combinations you can do, right? Yes. If, uh, so if that number is small, then Sam will do all the possible permutation. If you get maybe 20 and 20 in each group, there are plenty of permutations you can okay. do, right? Probably too many. And if you were to do them all, it would take a long time. So in that case, Sam will just say, okay, if you take a thousand, it's enough for the estimation, the p-value, so I'm going to stop there. Okay. okay? So it does a thousand, so you can input a thousand, it's going to do either, if you have a small sample size, all the ones that are possible, if it's more... Exactly. If, you, if, if the number is too large, and Sam will say, well, then after that, after maybe 500, they're redundant, so you don't need to do it, it will stop. Any questions about this? <coughs> yes? It's another stupid question. If you assume your false discovery rate, or you, you set a false discovery rate of whatever you might say 10%, aren't you making an assumption that the two populations are somehow differential expressed? Right? If you set a, a false discovery rate of 10%, but only a tiny number of genes are actually differential expressed between the two populations, aren't you just capturing all of um, not necessarily. So you're saying I want the maximum uh, false discovery to be 10%. No, I'm saying we make the assumption that you know, two gene sets may actually be differentially expressed and there may actually be something different between the two, where in fact they, we're just deluding ourselves in the actual two genes express the signature. No, I, I mean, I think, I, so I'm going to repeat your question just to make sure that I understand correctly. So you're saying if there's a lot of differentially expressed genes <clears throat> and you fix the FDR to 10%, it's fine. If there are only a few, then fixing it to 10%, you're going to get a lot of junk. Okay? Uh, <coughs> so what you do when you fix the, 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 the FDR to 10% doesn't mean that you're going to get 10% for sure. It just means that you're hoping that the maximum will be 10%. Okay? So in, in the case where you have only few differentially expressed genes, let's say there are only two differentially expressed genes, okay? Then if you get, if I give you a list of four, then the, the FDR will be, will be 50%. So you're not going to get tons of, of uh, false positive because remember it's the ratio of false positive respect to the one that I give you. So if I give you too many, right away you're going to get a large false discovery rate. Okay, so in order to have 10%, basically, I need to give you only two genes that are the true, because if I give you more than that, I'm going to get 25% or, or 50% right away. So it doesn't change anything. It's just that the list that I'm going to give you, it's probably going to be small or even maybe smaller, because if I give you two and one of them is a false positive, then right away it's 50%, right? So in that case, it's, of course, it's going to be more difficult for me to give you something because as soon as I will give you one uh, false positive, I'm going to pay a high price because one fa false positive will be at least 50% FTR. Okay, so... If you fix the false discovery rate that you get by 10 genes out of after, after you analyze it, you, so, expect that, you expect that one out of, out of the set is going to be false, false positive. Yeah, but here we're, we're saying... Let's imagine you have a data set when there's only two true positive genes. Okay. okay? In that case, it's going to be very difficult for me to give you a list of differentially expressed genes with a low FDR. Because if I do, there's, you know, there's a couple of possibilities. I give you the two true positive right away, then that's fine. There's 0% FDR. I give you the true, false po the true uh, positive plus one false positive, 
but then right away the FDR is 50%, right? Almost 50%. Or I give you two, one of them is a false positive, it's 50%, or I'll give you one false positive. So probably I will only give you one or zero gene because if I give you more than that, it's very likely that the FDR will be higher than what you want. Okay, so it's going to be more difficult to find something. You don't know. That we don't know. That, so that's one of the problems, right? It's what I said, is that we hope that, you know, the FDR is going to be less than 10%. If all the assumptions are, are correct, which they're not, because, you know, it, it's, it's real life, it's real data analysis, and it's real statistics. Um, but we're hoping that, you know, we've done some uh, validation, we've looked at the histograms, the, uh, the box plots, it seems that there's no big viol viol violation of the assumptions, so we might think that we're doing okay, but you will never know uh, uh, which ones are true and false positive. So here we know a little bit, we know that these are actually true positive, and we do get them, so we would expect to get these guys. But after that, we don't really know which ones should be positive or not. Um, yeah. There is there is a debate about uh, HPV uh, detection because if it's a uh, positive then they do a second test because there is not a potential to be fifty percent false positive. Then if it's false negative, why they want to do again test to make sure that it's really negative? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But I think it, it, <coughs> it all depends on, uh, you know, and, and it's what I say, it's always the price of, of the false positive and false negative. In some cases, you're very worried about a false positive, right? Yes. But in other cases, you're very yeah. worried about the false negative, right? Yeah, so, it, so in, it was uh, negative, and then on the second check, it was positive. So that means the first try was uh, false. Yeah. I mean, I mean, th this is one thing, you know, for the test, you cannot just test someone and say, oh, you're fine, you know, you don't have the disease or the virus or whatever, you know, go on and live a happy life and then that guy is really sick, right, and you should be giving him medication. So in that case, you really care about the false negative, right, whereas the false positive, you might say, okay, you know, uh, here we've done the test, you're positive, therefore we're going to do it again to make sure that it, it truly is, you know, a positive case. Well, I, you know, the truth is that I don't think doctors know much about maybe, statistics, maybe but... Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the hope, I think. Uh, but I think there are people who work with doctors in trying to make these things, you know. I mean, there are clinical trials and everything, and there's a lot of statisticians involved in, in these things. So, uh, before it gets to the doctor, uh, you know, there's a lot of statistics that's been done on, on these things. Right. Yeah. Yes. No, I mean, if I give you a p value. <coughs> the, well, the truth is that if you don't know anything about the data or the test statistics or whatever, if I. In, if, if someone tells, tells you, oh, I've done this and here's the p-value, you have no idea, right? I mean, I could just guess a, a number between 0 and 1, say, you know, 0.49, and I say, this is a p-value. It doesn't tell you anything. I mean, it's just garbage because I've guessed the number. There's not even uh, any statistics behind it. So for you to be able to say something about it, you need to go and, and understand what the test statistic was, what were the assumptions, uh, was it done correctly? You cannot just look at the p-value and say, oh, it's very small, I'm very confident that everything's fine and that it's not a false positive or whatever. No, no, I mean, uh, considering that you know, I've done yeah. the right to test and, and, and I've analyzed a uh, <coughs> thousand genes and, and, yeah, and, and, and so they are, are significant <coughs> and, and now I want to know which ones are <coughs> So in that case, of course, because if everything's correct, right, Typically, and if we just look at one gene, we forget about the multiple testing now. Mm -hmm. If you just look at one gene, you would reject if the p-value is less than 0.05, right? Fine, yes. Right? But if, if the p-value is 0.049, it's pretty close, right? So you're like, well, you know, 
would have been sort of almost likely to get something as extreme. But if it's, you know, 10 to the minus 10, you're like, well, I'm very confident that, you know, I should reject the null hypothesis. So, yes. So, in fact, this, I mean, this is a good question. So, often people will say, okay, let's fix alpha, we reject the, the test, and I say, this is false positive, this is false negative, this is um, different she expressed, this, this is not, this is different she expressed, this is not. I like to say, well, okay, you've done that, but maybe it's good to put a number with that. So keep the p-value, you know, put the p-value in your table because the p-value is kind of like the strength of the evidence, right? If it's really small, you're going to say, okay, the test is, is, the gene is differentially expressed. If it's not that small, but it was close to 0.05, uh, then you might say, okay, well, we called it differentially expressed, but, you know, it's right at the boundary, so maybe you should be more cautious about it. So, yes, it does tell you something. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, as a statistician, I would sort by p-value because... I know statisticians would like to do the p-value, but sometimes they fully change 1.2, but maybe the remedy is very close to each other, so this is why you bring my p-value, but maybe it's not p-value for the same thing. Yeah. It's a bad assumption to make if your mRNA is going to be indicative of a bunch of proteins that you express from it. There's lots of cases where genes have a very small change Yeah, and, and then it all comes down to, you know, do you really trust the, the uh, statistical methods you've done and so forth? If you do, then um, basically what you're talking about is kind of like statistical significance versus biological significance. I mean, if you know for sure that, you know, a full chance of 1.2 is not interesting to you, then don't look at it, right? Uh, I mean, this is something you know that I don't. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is not the question you ask me. You ask me, you know, what are the genes that you think are differentially expressed? And this is what I do, and this is what I give you the p-values. Now, if you think that it, if you think that what is interesting to you is not differentially expressed, but full chain is greater than two, then that's not the same question, right? So I think if if you if you don't want a small fault change, then maybe you should try to rephrase your question in another way to say, well, give me the genes that are at least that or that. So if you're like a value 0.01 versus 0.0001, are they really different? Or both of them are more likely to be true? You know? They are very different. I mean, if you give me a p-value, you know, and I give you the extreme case of 0.49, you know, and a p-value 10 to the minus 10, and you ask me, which one do you think is the most significant? Oh, I'll go with the 10 to the minus 10. Yeah. yeah so yeah. when you reach, let's say, 0 0.001, does that matter if 0, 0 0.00001 or, I mean, after a certain level of, wouldn't you, because, I, I mean, when you say 0 0.001, you are saying that less than 0.1% of the time it's going to be a false, right? It's going to be a uh, uh, reject, you are mm -hmm. going, uh, it's going to be by chance. But when you are dealing with 0.01% of the time, or 0.0001% of the time, is, does that matter? It depends. I mean, if you if you say, you know, it cost me a million dollars to look at one gene, I can only look at one, which one would you pick? I would pick the one that is the... the, the, the smaller p-value, right? So it does matter in that case. If you say, I don't care, I've got lots of money, you give me the list and I can look at all of them, no, then, you can, then it doesn't you can, matter. You can look at the function of the gene and then can go to the blood to find the biology. So um, if you matter. really want to rank them, then yes, it does matter because you need a way to rank the list and, and uh, to come to prioritize some genes to look at. I have another question regarding, still regarding this issue of the full change versus the, the p-value. Is that, can, how can, uh, can we, can't we expect that with a small sample size in doing microarrays, usually people have small sample sizes, I'm losing power, so if I'm going by the p-values, most likely I'm going to lose the most of maybe significant changes that, that are there, but I cannot see it because of the power of the, of the test, yeah. right? So, isn't, if, I'm, if I'm doing p-values, I'm, uh, what, I'm, what I'm doing is, is that I'm willing to reject the false uh, the false positives, but that I'm going to throw away a bunch of false negatives too, right? Whereas if I refer to make sure that that I put on downstream testing 
So this depends on the number. It's of a trade off. It's, yeah. it's always going to be a trade off between false, posit false yeah. positive and false negative. Yeah, sure. it, 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 and it's going to depend on you know your resources, what you can do, what you want to do. Uh, so there's no magic answer to that. It will all depend on the experiment and probably what you want to do with the experiment. Okay, so. <clears throat> okay, so there's, we've only talked about the t-test, but sometimes you want to know if uh, you've got 10 conditions and you want to know, find me the genes that are changing in at least one of these 10 conditions, right? Uh, so the way you can do that, there's a uh, 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 generalization of the t-test, which is called the f-test. It's exactly the same idea. It's going to try to find uh, changes across the, uh, all of the conditions. <clears throat> so the idea is pretty similar. You compute a test statistic, which is an f-test. You can compute a p-value, uh, and then you can rank your genes based on the p-value. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that because R can do it for you, but Sam also does it for you. So instead of doing a t-test, he will do an f-test, and the story is exactly the same. So here it's just saying I have more than two conditions. Let's say I have three conditions, and I want to find the genes that are differentially expressed in at least one of these three conditions. Like, like the um, ANOVA to the t-test? Yeah, so actually an f-test is, is ANOVA. Yeah. It's coming from an ANOVA. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Say that again? Yes, um, I did not say that, but actually it's on the slide. So Sam also uses the modified uh, f-test. So because of the same kind of problem, because the f-test is also a ratio of two things, you need to tweak it a little bit so that you don't run into the problem where the standard deviation is small at the bottom of the test. And this is, in fact, very important. The, the f-test can be uh, very bad for that as well. So there are other alternatives that need not really talk about. So there's uh, non-parametric versions of the t-test. We've seen some of them, but also of the f-test. Um, there's We've seen the modified version of the, the f and t-test. And there's also some methods I call uh, Bayesian methods, uh, either empirical or fully Bayesian approaches. These are very similar to what Sam does. So when you do the correction of the standard deviation, it's kind of like saying, well, I've got my uh, constant that I add. This is almost kind of like my prior information, what I know about the standard deviation uh, from all the other genes. So it's kind of like doing something Bayesian. 